Okay guys, we're picking back up with chapter 39. This is on page 100 of the PDF. And we will um, finish uh, chapters 39 through 45. And that's the end of the book. Our pockets were stuffed with dried herring. Janina smelled like salt and fish. When we came near our two brick hole, we saw lights and people. We hid in the shadows and waited. Finally, the lights went out and the people left. We ran to the hole. It wasn't there. Only an unbroken flatness of brick. We crept along the wall. We went into Stalky Station. Boxcar doors were clanking, swallowing whole parades of people. Aching to get back to the ghetto, we looked for the Stalky Station hole that had been coming through to see the trains. It, too, was gone. There's other holes, I said. All night long, we darted from shadow to shadow along the never-ending wall, dodging jackboot guards searching for a way into the ghetto. There were guards and lights and flat brick walls, but no holes. We heard gunshots and screams coming from the ghetto, dog barking, the glow of flamethrowers. Janina became more and more agitated. Whenever she heard a gunshot, she piped, Ta-ta! She kicked, the wall, kicked at the wall. He's all right, I told her. I hugged her. The sky was gray. The stars were fading. When we got back to where we started, daylight was coming and we were stuck in heaven. I found white dust at the base of the wall. I washed my face and hands in it. In it, Janina laughed. She smacked me with a dried fish. Then we ate it. We slept on the ground in the merry-go-round park. We woke up at noon and walked out of the city. I remember Yuri's words. I told Janina, don't look guilty. What's guilty, she said. I forget, I said. Just don't look it. I reached into her pocket and pushed her crumpled armband deeper out of sight. We wandered the streets among the people in bomb craters chewing dried fish. We made a game. Who could look less guilty? We laughed. We said hello to people. We ran back to the merry-go-round to ride the horses, but the horses were still. I kept listening for the tootling music, but all I heard were gunshots from the other side of the wall. When night returned, we approached the wall, and I realized how stupid I was. What, I'd been, what had I been thinking? Were the holes going to come back? Was the wall going to be lower than last night? I wish we had big Henrik's shoulders to climb on. I tried to think tried to think. Suddenly, Janina ran to the wall and cupped her hands above her mouth and yelled with all her might, Ta-ta! I tackled her and rolled into the shadows as a jackboot down, as a jackboot down the wall turned. Just to be doing something, we began to tour the, around the wall. When we came to Stalky Station, where it was all, where it was always daytime with the lights and trotting people and clanking boxcars, I suddenly knew what to do. The stocky street gate in the wall was open. People were parading through. I grabbed her hand, pulled her along. We crouched behind the shed near the gate. Jack boots with dogs guarded both sides of the gate. The people slumped along with their suitcases, heads hung low, as if they didn't know the teeth of the dogs were snapping into their faces. I did not bother to give Janina instructions. Why should I? She copied everything I did. I dashed for the parade of people. I plunged into them. I lost myself among their legs. While they headed for the trains, I groped the shoulders in the opposite direction. They paid no attention to me than the dogs. When I sensed I had passed through the gate to the ghetto side, I broke sharply to my right, popped out of the parade, and bolted. There were dogs and shouts behind me, then gunshots. My first prayer plucked, plucked at my lips. No flamethrowers, please. But then there were shadows and rubble, and I was tucked into a pocket of blackness like a rat. I did not know if she was with me until my heart and lungs calmed down. Then I could hear her panting beside me. There, when no one seemed about, we ran for home. I knew the news was as bad as we raced up the steps. There were no bodies to hurdle. The squatters were gone. Our door was open. Moonlight misted from the window like winter breath. The room was empty. The table and chairs were overturned. The pill cabinet was smashed. Janina cried out. She flung herself on the floor and on, on, into the corners. She scrubbed the shadows with her body, hoping he was only hiding, not gone. She whimpered along the walls, Ta-ta! Ta-ta! She ran to the window, Ta-ta! Where was Uncle Shepsel? I expected him to arise any moment in the middle of the room and declare, I tried to warn them, the Jews, they would not listen. Then I saw it in the moonlight on the floor, the Book of Lutherans. Janita knocked me aside and she ran the ran from the room down the steps. I ran after her across the courtyard, down the middle of the moonlight streets to Stocky Station. The endless parade was still shuffling through the gate in the yellow light. 
I lost her as we plunged into the people. I did likewise. The dogs gasped at their leashes, but no one tried to stop us. On the other side of the wall, I made my way from side to side of the parade, bouncing off suitcases, searching for her. Whistles shrieked. Box cars, box car doors screamed. Dogs yapped and snarled. Jack boots and dogs and bayonets threw gigantic jerking shadows on the crowd, on the ground. I kept working my way backward to the parade so I would not be carried to the boxcars. I peeked out from the people, searching, keeping myself hidden among the shuffling legs and suitcases. Then I saw her, or did I? Was it really her? How could I be sure? It was four or five boxcars down the line. Everything, the people's heads, the straining dogs, the roost of the boxcars was in the black silhouette against the sickly light. She was a shadow cut loose, held above the other shadows by a pair of jackboot arms. She was thrashing and screaming above the silent masses. I could not make her out, make out her words, but the sound of the voice was hers, and I was running, breaking from the parade and running toward her. And then the arms came forward, and she was flying. Janita was flying over the shadow heads and the dog soldiers, her arms and legs turning slowly. She seemed so light, so right for the air. I thought, she's happy. I thought she would sail forever like a milkweed puff as the endless breeze, and I was running and wishing I could fly with her, and then she was gone, swallowed by the black maw of a boxcar, and even as I felt the hot breath of the dog, I could hear the, rum the rumble and the boxcar door slamming shut. I tried to run to her, but the dog wouldn't let me go, and the dog was gone, and the boot came swinging, and I was kicked so hard I popped off the ground. When I landed, a club pounded my shoulders, and I was kicked again, and the jackboot was dragging me by the hair, and there was laughing and clacking of dog of jack dog teeth. The jackboot flung me against the wall. I saw his hand on my hol on his holster. I saw the gun come out and point between my eyes. Die, piglet! The voice. I looked up. The red hair. The face. Yuri. I cried. The gun went off. Chapter forty. Then, my nose tickled, my cheek. I brushed away the tickles. They came back. Snips of buzzing. I opened my eyes. White clouds sailing across the blue sky. Darting spots. Flies. Something was ringing. My ears hurt. My arm hurt. Everything hurt. I was wet. I was in water. I sat up. I was in a puddle of water in a ditch. I started to climb out of the ditch and fell back. The ringing would not stop. I looked at my arm where the teeth of the dog had shaken me. The gash was crusty like dark red blood. Flies danced over it. I stared at them. They were busy. I put my hand on my ear, the one that had was with the missing earlobe. I felt a crusty lump, but not much more. I sat back and closed my eyes and listened to the ringing. Janina! I scrambled up from the ditch. Stalky station, station was empty. No jack boots, no Jews. The trains were gone. The gates were closed. I headed for the empty tracks. I felt dizzy. Then I was walking up on the ground. I tried again. The world wobbled. I saw something in the hard dirt. I reached to pick it up and got dizzy as I f and fell on my head. I cried out and went to sleep. When I opened my eyes, it was right there. A black shredded scrap. Her shoe. That was that. That I had seen my face in. Her shoe, the one that I had seen my face in, I would have known it anywhere. I ran my fingertips over it. I smiled. I picked it up and picked myself up and wobbled on. I came to the edge of the platform. I sat down, my feet dangling toward the tracks below. The ringing was loud. I felt dizzy again. When I woke up, I was on the tracks, the shoe in my hand. The tracks curved out of the station. I started to walk. I walked out of the station yard, out of the world. The tracks came to a point in the sky. Chapter 41 I came to a boy. He was throwing stones down the track. A black and white dog was with him. When the dog came in, when the dog came, when the dog saw me, it came running. I was afraid, but the dog wagged its tail and licked the crusty gash on my arm. Who are you? said the boy. He wore shoes, clothes, no boils. Misha, I said, do you have water? The sun flashed off the steel rail. Where's your ear, said the boy. Stalky station. Where are you going, he said. To the ovens. What ovens? Where the trains go? Why are you going to the ovens? 
That's where Janina is, I said. Do you know her? He shook his head. Do you know Yuri? Do you know Dr. Korchik? Do you have water? Could I touch your ear? I said yes. He reached out. I think he touched it, but I could not feel. He looked at me. Are you a Jew? Yes. I pulled the armband from my pocket. I slipped it onto my good arm. See? Yes. He disappeared into the weeds with the dog. He returned with a pan of water. I drank it. I walked on. Day, night. Day, night. I ate blackberries from thorny whips that reminded me of barbed wire. I pulled scallions from the earth. I drank from ditches. When I bent to cut my hands in the water, the ringing pulsed in my ears. The steel rails flashed in the sun. I shivered as if it were winter. My wounded ear would not dry out. I awoke in the weeds. I awoke on the tracks. The steel rails wobbled away from me like silvery snakes. I was in many places, and I was not alone. <laughs> Bufo was there, smiling, waiting for me. I could smell the mint. The blue man rode the merry-go-round to the tootling music. I saw bodies wrapped in newspapers floating above the sidewalks. I, I felt Yuri smack me in the head and call me stupid. I saw Himmler's car stop and Himmler himself get out and march right up to me and snap his heels together and salute me and say, Hanukkah! I saw the orphans. They were marching down the tracks led by Dr. Korsik. The orphans were marching and singing, their shoes all hitting the ground at once, and the oven door opened and into the oven they went, heads held high, marching and singing. Every day, Mr. Milgram stroked my hair. Every day, I heard Cuba laughing. Every day, I looked from Jan for Janine, and every day, she was not there. I was used to her constant presence and to her mimicking everything I did. I kept glancing around to see myself repeated, but there was only me. One day, when I opened my eyes, a man was standing over me. Chapter 42 The man placed his foot on my chest. You're a Jew, he said. Yes, I answered. I pointed to my armband. See, what are you doing here? I'm following the train. Janina, I'm going to the ovens. What ovens? The ovens for the Jews. I'm a filthy son of Abraham. They forgot me. Can you take me to the ovens? The man spit in the weeds. I don't know what you're talking about. You make no sense. Are you insane? The word was new to me. I don't know, but I'm stupid and tiny and fast. He jerked me to my feet. Tiny is right. He tore the armband away. What happened to your ear? Yuri did it. He tried to kill me, but he missed. Come with me, he said. I took a step and fell back to the ground. When I awoke, I was bouncing in a cart pulled by a donkey. When it stopped, the man slung me over his shoulder and dumped me into a heap of hay in a barn. The farmer's wife came and gave me water and a carrot to eat. With water and rags, she cleaned my wounded ear. Then she tied a rag around my head and covered the ear, covered that, covered the ear in one eye. Do you know Yuri, I said? She tied another rag around my crusty arm. Did you see Janina? She touched my forehead. You're burning and you stink. The farmer's wife put me in a wooden tub and scrubbed me until I screamed. She brought me clothes. She burned my old ones with the shoe in my pocket. The wife came every day and cleaned my ear and my arm and, and felt my forehead and gave me water and carrots and boiled turnips. I slept in the hay and played with the mice in the barn. One was my favorite. I shared my turnips with it. I called it Janina. I taught it to run up my arm and stand on my head. Then the cat ate it. One day I awoke and the ringing was gone. I walked out of the barn and through the fields until I came to the tracks. A spot of white caught my eye, the armband. Snagged in a thorn bush, I stuffed it in my pocket. I had been walking the tracks for a long time when the farmer stopped me. Where are you going? He said. To the ovens. The farmer knocked me down with a swat of his hand, and I was back in the donkey cart with a rope around my neck. I was tied to a stable post in the barn. I remembered Yuri's story of my beginnings, becoming a slave to farmers. Maybe the story wasn't made up after all. Maybe I was catching up with my life. After Sunday, the farmer's wife came to the barn and said, You must not run away. There is a new law. All children must work on the farms. Then to the ovens, I said. Yes, she said. Chapter 43. I slept in the barn, ate in the barn, worked in the barn. I wasn't wor 
When I wasn't working in the barn, I worked in the fields. I hauled rocks in the donkey cart. I picked bugs from the vegetables when I wasn't picking them from myself. I learned to milk the cow. One day, the cow kicked me. I told it what happened to the cow in the ghetto. The farmer's wife, her name was El <clears throat> Elzbeta, fed me with the pigs. The pig toilet was my toilet. Every night, I was tied to the stable post. Sometimes in the night, on the far side of the field, I had heard the huffing of locomotives and the clack of iron wheels. Many times, I asked Elzbeta, the wife, when will the law be over? When can I go to the ovens? Soon, she always said, but you must not run away. If you do, the Nazis will burn down the farm and feed us to the pigs. So I worked and waited and talked with the donkey and the mice. Then one day, a man came into a hor in a horse cart and said something to the farmer and went away. Later, I heard the farmer shouting in the house. That night, I was awakened by a voice, the wife's, run. The rope around my ankle was gone. There was something under my shirt against my skin, bread. I ran. The war was over. I had been on the farm for three years. I was back to walking the tracks. This time I had company. Thousands were trudging the tracks, the roads, the fields. No jackboots guarded, guarded them. There were carnivals, markets. They sprang up in fields along the railroads and were gone the next day. People sold things, shoes, cigarette lighter, apples, anything for money, anything for food. I saw a tent made from bed sheets. A man was calling, Come in, come in. See, her Hitler, come right in. Only 50 Zolo. <clears throat> Lotsies. I did not have even one Lotsy. I waited until someone was paying and slid under the bed sheet. Lying on the ground was a skeleton. It was Its bony feet had been stuffed into the black, long black boots. A steel helmet swallowed half the grinning skull. Another man called, Ten Lotsies. You won't believe your eyes. There was no tent, only a handkerchief. A customer paid. The man stood in my way so I could not see. He lifted the handkerchief and let it fall. The customer wanted his money back. While the two fought on the ground, I lifted the handkerchief. It was something I'd never seen. Something Furry had said did not exist. Something Mr. Milgram said was like happy. It was an orange. The hucksters fascinated me the most. I stood in front of them for hours as they ran into the passing parades about the wonders under the t their tents and handkerchiefs. They never stopped. They never ran out of the wor of words. When I lay down in the weeds or the barn at night, I whispered into the dark, Come and look. You won't believe your eyes. I dreamed of, of bodiless jackboots trampling the earth. I dreamed of burning cows. I dreamed of stone angel looked down on me and said, I'm nobody. I walked the, tr the tracks and roads. I offered my services to farmers for food and a bed of straw in the barn. When there was no work, I took my food from wherever I could find it. I drank my water from balm craters. I rode on trains. So did many others. I rode on boxcars and cinder cars and tankers. I rode, th I rode a thousand trains. No one ever took me to Janina or to Candy Mountain. Somewhere along the way, I heard the story of Hansel and Gretel, and I knew at the end was not true, that the witch did not die in the oven. One day, I found myself back in the city of Warsaw. The bomb craters were gone. There was still rubble. Trucks and carts were hauling it away. I thought I heard a machine gun. I ducked in a doorway. It was a jackhammer. I saw people slumped in alleyways, but they were not covered in newspaper. They were sleeping for real. I found the ghetto. The wall was gone. I walked right in. I looked for Niska Street. I could not find it. I could not find our house, or the orphan's house, or Olek hanging, or the rug we slept under. There was rubble and there was nothing. Even the flies were gone. On the trains I had heard about the revolt. Until then, I had thought I was the last one out of the ghetto. I did not know that 40,000 people were still there. The following spring, as I hauled the farmer's rocks, the Jews turned on the jackboots with stolen guns and bombed and bottle bombs, but the jackboots were too many. Their tanks and flamethrowers and the revolt was over by May and the people were herded to the last of the trains and the ghetto was no more. Standing in the silent dust, I understood at last that Yuri had done was that, <clears throat> standing in the silent dust, I understand at last what Yuri had done and what he had done, what he had saved me from. I understood that the Yuri I knew, the real Yuri, was not the one the Nazis knew. 
I smiled to think of him on the last day, once again in his own cl his own clothes, shaking his fist at the oncoming tanks, his red hair flaring, invisible no more, calling all the world's attention to himself. After I walked out of the ghetto there was no that was no longer there, I wandered the streets of the city. I stole my food. One day, in a crowd on the sidewalk, I caught a whiff of mint. I stopped, looked about, ran back the other way. I stared into faces. I sniffed. There it was again, mint. A man's mouth was working. A fleck of green on his lip. A grisly, bony man. White whiskers, sunken eyes. Ragged clothes. Bare feet so dirty I thought he wore shoes or socks. No club, no fat belly. I planted myself in front of him. He stopped. Fat man? His head didn't move. His eyes sagged down to me. I tugged on his rags. Fat man? His eyes were dead. Fat man, it's me, Misha. Me and Janina, remember? He did not hear. I shook him. Fat man, Bufo, you hate me. You want to kill me. Here I am. Here. I took his hand and put it on my head. Kill me. His hand slid off my head and flopped to his side. I punched him in his bony stomach. Fat man, look. I pulled from my pocket something I had been carrying all this time, the armband. Once blue and white, now mostly black. I rolled it up on my sleeve. Look, fat man, I'm a Jew. You have to kill me. Look. But he did not look. He shuffled to me, almost knocking me down, and shuffled away. I watched him until he was lost in the crowd. I took off the armband and let it fall to the sidewalk. Chapter 44 The world was returning to normal. But for me, there was no normal to return to. Normal for me was stolen bread and ditch water. Little by little, I learned about forks and money and toothpaste and toilets. Back in the countryside, I did, I did what I did best. I stole. I snatched everything I could carry. I became my own donkey. I pulled a little cart everywhere I went. And wherever I stopped, I became a carnival. I was so good at stealing, people saw things in my cart that they found nowhere else. And I was cheap. What did I know of prices? By the end of the day, my pocket was only a little less empty than my wagon. But who cared, for I had discovered my voice. I became a huckster like the ones that had fascinated me. Oh, bread for sale, apples, shoes, cigarettes, ladies, undergarments, come and see, amazing bargains. For me, it was more about talking than selling. There had been a few words bur burst during and before the ghetto. But up until the end of this year, I had probably not spoken 2,000 words in my life. Now you could not shut me up. If my cart was empty, I kept on hawking just to hear myself talk. I wallowed in words. There was no end to them. They were free for the taking. No one ever chased me down the road yelling, Stop, thief! He stole, he stole my word. Time went by. I talked enough and stole enough and sold enough to buy a steamboat a steamship ticket and I joined the multitudes going to America. The immigration officer said, what is your name? Misha Mulgram, I said. What is a Misha? He said, your name is Jack. I became Jack Milgram. I learned English. I went on talking. In America, that means I was a salesman. No one hired me to sell the best product. <clears throat> no one hired me to sell the best products. Problems were my size. I had stopped growing at five feet, one in inch. My accent and my missing ear, which now looked like a clump of cauliflower. I couldn't blame them. Who would let a galoot in the door? Good day, madam. Can I interest you in a nice vacuum cleaner? Forget it. Then I got my big break. I was hired to sell a miracle vegetable chopper on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey. I was given a table and a pile of cucumbers. Ten o'clock in the morning, people gathered in front of me. I began describing the wonders of this miracle chopper. Somebody called, what'd you do, chop your ear off? Before I was halfway through my spiel, the last person was walking away. I felt desperate. Wait, I called. My mouth took over. There's something I have to tell you. Dr. Korshik was right. There was a cow, and it burned like a marshmallow. The people stopped and turned. They were thinking, what's he talking about? What's that have to do with the miracle chopper? Who cared as long as I was talking? Himmler looked like my Uncle Shepsel. My Uncle Shepsel looked like a chicken. You want to know what rats taste like? Rats taste like my, uh, rat tastes like my mouse. Excuse me. You want to know what rats taste like? Rat tastes like mouse. 
I'm going to warn you one last time. Do not take the horse from the merry-go-round. I told them everything except for Janina. All that I had seen.